Welcome to Open Access. I'm Mary O'Driscoll. We're honored to have both FERC Chairman Neil Chatterjee and Commissioner Rich Glick with us today to discuss the landmark FERC rule that opens up wholesale power markets to distributed energy resources. Order number 2222 is a huge step forward in getting us to the grid of the future and encouraging development of energy sources and technologies of all stripes. Welcome, both of you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Um, I wanted to go to Chairman Chatterjee first, but please don't be afraid to step in and add your thoughts if the questions they ask are not directed at you. Um, so, Chairman, some people can't quite get their heads around just what it is that FERC has done. For instance, some people wonder if the Commission is going to be handing out subsidies to people to put solar panels on their houses. So, how do you explain why this is such a groundbreaking move? Uh, thank you. That's a great question. Uh, to be clear, this is this has absolutely nothing to do with subsidies. So, thank you for letting me start with that point. This is all about unleashing the power of our markets. Uh, Order 2222, it just it removes market barriers to distributed energy resources or DERs. I, I get it. That sounds like it's technical alphabet soup, but it's it's really quite simple. We're talking about smaller energy resources located in our homes, our businesses, within communities. I'm thinking here, rooftop solar panels, electric vehicles, really advanced water heaters. What our rule did was say, you know what? These smaller assets should be able to join together through the power of technology and compete in our wholesale electric markets, just like the large power plant down the street. So just think about that. This action, in my view, is revolutionary and will help us pave the way for the grid of the future. It lets our markets be a catalyst for bringing new technologies and cleaner resources online. And the big payoff here is really for consumers. This action will make our markets more efficient, and it also promises to drive down costs for consumers. It also makes our grid more nimble, flexible, and reliable. Uh, so this rule is just a very forward-leaning, technology-focused way to carry out our mandate to ensure consumers have access to reliable power um, at just and reasonable rates. And I'm really proud uh, to have worked so closely with my colleague, Commissioner Glick, to bring this uh, historic ruling forward. Okay. Um, thanks. So, Commissioner Glick, what, in your view, is the most significant development that could come out of this new rule? Well, I don't think I could just point to one. There's so many very important developments, I think, associated with this rule. As the chairman mentioned, there's a lot of DERs out there already, a lot of rooftop solar, electric appliances like water heaters, electric vehicles. They're all, they're all over the place. And allowing them to participate in the wholesale market, in the organized markets at least, is going to allow them to, to add just add new capacity, add new energy sources, add diversity to our regional uh, energy mix, and that's going to help improve reliability, decrease customers' bills, and it's going to promote or help the transition to a clean energy future that we're undoubtedly in right now. In addition to that, we're giving these DERs by allowing them to participate in the wholesale market another revenue source, which is very important. Yes, we're going to we're going to need significantly more DERs as we go into the future, as we go into a cleaner energy future, and by giving them an additional re additional revenue stream, we're going to promote the electric the additional electrification that we need to fight climate change. Okay, um, Chairman, back to you. You've been particularly outspoken about this new rule in the context of electric vehicles and what they might be able to contribute to the grid. Um, can you explain that? Absolutely. Um, I think just a great real life example uh, of how Order 2222 will create new opportunities and change is when it comes to electric vehicles or EVs. Um, we've seen some estimates that there'll be almost 19 million electric vehicles on the road in the U.S. by the end of this decade. And that's really on the low end. 
when all those vehicles are plugged in, say, in our garages in the future, through the power of technology, they'll be able to virtually form one large battery providing grid level services, like providing energy when we need it most. So um, Commissioner Glick and I are, are roughly the same age. He may not remember uh, a, a cartoon that I grew up with, Voltron, where all these different uh, separate characters came together to form Voltron, this uh, superhero. That's what these batteries may have the capacity to do. Um, I think vehicle-to-grid technologies, they're still uh, developing and advancing, but that's part of the beauty of the action that we took. Um, Order 2222 is technology neutral, meaning that as technology evolves and improves, it's only going to create new opportunities, and our markets will remain a platform for that. What's really exciting about it is uh, Commissioner Glick talked about you know, its impact on climate change. I think we at the commission, and I particularly want to commend Commissioner Glick for his leadership on this, have done a great deal to squeeze carbon out of the power sector. But at the end of the day, the single most significant source of carbon emissions in the U.S. is in the transportation sector. If our actions on the power sector side lead to the increased deployment of electric vehicles, that can only help squeeze carbon out of the transportation sector as well. And that's a big deal, not just for the economy and consumers, but for the environment as well. Okay. Um, Commissioner Glick, do you have a Voltron reference? Well, I'm a little bit older than Chairman Chatterjee. I actually uh, used to watch Bugs Bunny when I was growing up, so need to learn about Voltron. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, Commissioner Glick, I'll give you another question then. Um, you're a Democrat, and Chairman Chatterjee is a Republican. So what's the significance of this new rule as a product of bipartisan agreement? Well, you know, I don't necessarily view, I mean, certainly Chairman Chatter is a Republican. I'm a Democrat. I, everyone knows that. But I don't necessarily view FERC as a part, as supposed to be a partisan agency. We're not supposed to represent our party. We're supposed to follow the law, follow the regulations, follow the facts. I think we do that. And I think in, at times we have our strong disagreements, and certainly there's a number of issues we've had the chairman and I have disagreed upon. But on the other hand, there's a lot of areas where we, where we have strong agreement. I think this is certainly one of them. I think the commission has done an excellent job over the years removing barriers to new technologies, which is what we're required to do under the Federal Power Act. And this is one particular example, but under the chairman's leadership, we also issued Order 841 for storage, and we're also exploring other avenues on offshore wind, uh, hybrid technologies. There's other, th other areas that we can still do more on. But again, I want to commend the chairman for working with me and working with my office in getting to a yes on the, on the CER rule, because as, as the chairman mentioned, it has a lot of significant benefits. And, and again, we weren't, we didn't sit down as Republicans and Democrats. We sat down as commissioners and worked it out. And Mary, I just want to uh, build on that real quick. Um, sorry to interject, but, um, I, you know, Commissioner Glick deserves a lot of credit for this. When I first came to the commission um, and he and I were both new together and we looked at both the storage rulemaking and the DER rulemaking, he was really instrumental in, in helping me appreciate the significance um, of, of what these policies uh, could be. You know, we're a, we're a quasi-judicial uh, body, but we also, you know, have uh, this ability to uh, initiate rulemakings. And he really showed me uh, what potential there was in these areas and convinced me to stay the course. Um, and I committed to him that I would. Uh, and uh, as I reflect back, you know, it took a long time, probably much longer than Commissioner Glick uh, would have wanted or anticipated initially. But at the end of the day, we, we got to the resu right result. And uh, I just, uh, uh, I, I give credit where credit's due. Uh, he really pressed me hard on this over the course of uh, a number of years. Um, and uh, uh, I'm forever grateful for uh, for his work and his leadership and that of his team. Uh, and I'm particularly proud that I think this is something that will outlast both of our tenures at the agency. And, and that's something to be to be proud of. 
Well, okay. Mary, if I could interject just 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 of one more minute here. I, again, I want to commend the chairman because yes, all that is true. I, but I think he, he committed to me when, when I first got to the commission that he would work with me on this, and he did every step of the way. And sometimes I, I, I did get a little frustrated at the speed of it. But the chairman worked out the technical issues. We worked out the legal issues, and I think we came up with a really helpful uh, rulemaking that I think is going to, as the chairman mentioned, is going to have an impact for many years to come. All right. Um, well, Chairman, let me go back to you then. Why would FERC get involved in something like this? I mean, the, the commission is supposed to be fuel and resource neutral. So what do you say to those who might argue that with this rule, um, FERC is putting its thumb on the scale for renewable resources? Yeah, I don't think we are. Um, I think uh, like uh, – uh, most other commission actions that we've taken, the key principle underpinning this rule is that it's fuel neutral and it's technology neutral. And that means it doesn't discriminate between resource types or technology types. The premise is that if a DER aggregation can perform and provide a service in our markets, that aggregation should be compensated just like any other resource. Um, I think it creates a totally level playing field. Um, and so I think, again, to, to your core question, why would FERC get involved in something like this? It's within our purview to do so. Um, this was a rulemaking that was originally initiated by former Chairman Bay, um, and it's one that Commissioner Glick, uh, in particular, was interested in, worked with me on, convinced me of the merits on, and I think uh, ultimately, uh, I think it will withstand legal scrutiny because we didn't put our thumb on the scale for a particular resource. We simply removed barriers to markets, uh, and uh, I think that's completely consistent with uh, other actions that we have taken during my tenure as chairman. Okay. Um, Commissioner Glick, back to you. How long do you think it's going to be before we see any of the fruits of this rule? I don't think, I don't think very long. You know, we, we, as the order requires, the rule requires that it's after 60 days, uh, that the rule comes into effect. And then there's a, I think a 270 day period for the RTOs to uh, submit their compliance filings. And certainly that's going to take a little bit while. We have to review the compliance filings and act on them. I want to make a plug. I certainly hope that everyone listening participate in those compliance filing, compliance filing proceedings because they're very important. But in the meantime, in the interim, I think there's a lot of uh, additional investments that investment that is going to occur because of this rulemaking. I think we already have a lot of DER technologies already. I think we're going to see more. I think we're, we're going to unleash a significant amount of additional new investments. So I think we're going to see that sooner rather than later. The market rules will come, but I think the investment and the uh, great creativity that's going to lead to new, new and hopefully improved DERs will occur right now. Okay. Um, Chairman, rank has its privileges. You get the last word. You all just completed a day-long technical conference on carbon pricing in wholesale electric markets. I believe it was, what, nine and a half hours? So what's going on here? Is FERC getting involved in environmental matters or, or what? So to be clear here, uh, we're not an environmental regulator. And so we're not in a driver's seat on emissions policy. But as states are taking the lead in adopting policies to curb emissions, carbon pricing is emerging as an important tool. So we were asked by a broad array of stakeholders to convene a discussion about what that might mean for the markets that we at FERC oversee. And that's why we convened our technical conference. Um, my overarching takeaway from the conference, from the nine and a half hours, and I really uh, appreciate uh, Commissioner Glick's endurance uh, uh, to power through that uh, with me, um, there was a lot of consensus and enthusiasm about market-oriented solutions from this diverse array of participants. And I'm talking, we had a high level of engagement and rich discussion, 32 panelists, leaders in their fields, everyone from legal scholars to economists uh, to CEOs. I'm very grateful for, uh, for the time and the insights 
that they gave us, we heard broad-based agreement that carbon pricing is a transparent, efficient tool for addressing emissions. And it's a tool that's superior to and less costly than other heavy-handed and less transparent approaches. Uh, and so that was important. Um, we also heard some important points about how FERC should proceed and to proceed cautiously in this space and about the complexities and importance of a, of a bottom-up approach to allow states and regions and their diverse stakeholders to coalesce around a market proposal. And so um, there's a lot of work to, 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 to get through. Um, but I, I was very pleased with the discussion. I think it was very productive. I was grateful for the engagement. Uh, and again, um, I really want to thank Commissioner Glick, not just for participation in the conference, uh, but he and his team did a lot of work uh, in the preparation for the conference as well. And that work and that preparation led to what I thought was a very productive day. And I look forward to working with Commissioner Glick and Commissioner Danley and staff at the commission to see uh, what we can do with this record moving forward. Okay, Commissioner Glick, you wanted to add anything on that? Well, I I, I don't disagree. I agree with everything the chairman said. It was, it was a long long day, but it was a very productive day, and I think again it furthers what I think the commission does, which is again we're not as commission chairman mentioned we're not an environmental regulator, but we have to clear the deck essentially clear clear out any barriers there might be to states and the federal government as they move forward with a cleaner energy future. And I think yesterday's uh, technical conference uh, demonstrates that. Okay. All right. Well, thank you both of you for joining us today. This was a lot of fun. Um, and thank you all for listening. We'll see you next time. FERC is an independent regulatory agency that oversees the interstate transmission of electricity, natural gas, and oil, reviews proposals to build interstate natural gas pipelines and liquefied natural gas terminals, and oversees the licensing of non-federal hydropower projects. FERC protects the reliability of the high-voltage interstate transmission system through mandatory reliability standards, and it monitors interstate energy markets to ensure that everyone in those markets is playing by the rules. Unless otherwise noted, the views expressed in these podcasts are personal views and do not necessarily express the views of individual commissioners or the commission as a whole. The podcast is a production of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission Office of External Affairs. We'll be updating our posts when we've got news, so be sure to check out our website, www.ferc.gov, and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn to find out when our next podcast airs.